Hey, Empowered Badass Breeders. Here are three things I look at when um, deciding if I'm gonna take an older dog into my program um, to be a potential sire or dam and or when I raise my own puppies when it comes time to not only health testing but temperament testing, you know. Um, I, I think we tend to, I was sitting out on my patio the other day thinking about this and looking back at my journey. Um, I'm thinking about all the dogs I've released for my program because part of their health testing didn't um, line up to what the standards are on paper right now. Um, and some of it's a little subjective. And so I sat there thinking how many other breeders are making these same decisions with really good lines, like really good temperament. And there's just one small thing that may or may not be a problem on paper. Um, and it's kind of a frustrating place to be because we're eliminating some of my best dogs I've eliminated from my program that I'm like, it it was really, really difficult. So it's this tough balance of here are the standards, you have to meet them, it's black or white. But the problem is nothing in life is black or white, number one. Number two, and this could be another whole video, um, hell, testing, <laughs> hell testing is its own uh, difficulty in, has its own difficulty in so many other factors at play. Like, okay, so for example, poodles can get an Addison's test, but that only shows that they have Addison's right now at this time. It cannot tell us will they have Addison's in the future, right? And um, even hip x-rays through OFA, did the x-ray technician take the x-rays the way they should be done? Was the dog sedated like it should have been sedated? Was the dog in the right shape? Um, and then they have three different people look at it. So what is their take? And there's all these biases that come into play too. So anyway, beyond all that, <laughs> I got off track. Um, what are some temperament things I look for in a dog before I'll breed it? Here are three things, just try to make it easy. And there are more, but like, here's just like three things off the top to look for that are red flags for me. Do I want to breed this dog? Now, with that being said, I cannot and you should not take into account when the dog is already in a breeding program and they're around unfixed males and females because that changes a lot of things. I'm telling you now who that dog is in your program with in the environment and a breeding environment can be very different who they'll be spayed and neutered in, in a home. So the best thing to do is get a gauge of temperament outside of outside of that environment. So looking at um, stranger danger, like how much does this dog not like to meet new people? And not only not like them, but are they barking and growling and backing up? That's a red flag for me to breed a dog like that. Again, that could be nature versus nurture, so you have to look at things holistically, so nothing's black and white as we know in this business, just something to look out for. If everything else lines up great and you know the lines and you know, well, this dog had a maybe I didn't socialize it enough or if you think you can articulate that this isn't in the lines then you might be okay if everything else is really good I mean those are just one of those decisions you have to make but that's always a red flag for me I don't like dogs that have stranger danger Two, aggression any kind of aggression resource guarding aggression toward other dogs again you cannot calculate that in a breeding program because I've had the nicest dogs turn on each other when they're both in heat. You know, females are like high school girls. And if um, they see another female breeding with a the male they bred with, oh my gosh, like, or if they have puppies, like you cannot evaluate temperament in that kind of environment. It's not fair. But any kind of aggression, huge red flag. I don't want to breed this dog. And number three, the inability to recover after being startled. And that is can play into confidence and nerve strength and sight and sound sensitivity. So kind of wrap it all into one when you look at an older dog what is their ability to recover after being startled so do they have a nice recovery like even if they're not very very brave but they 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 startled and they recovered nicely and I'm able to continue moving forward with them I like to see good nerve strength so if they startle at something I want to see a nice recovery I don't want them to re reach threshold over something fairly simple and they shut down and give me lots of stress signals and they flee or try to fight um, or freeze, right? So we wanna see that they can return right back to that normal brain and be curious and brave. So those are top three things I look for in temperament of an older dog before I place them in my program. Of course, you gotta look at everything holistically and all the health testing, but three top temperament traits that give red flags. <laughs> Let's talk about the first three to five days after your client takes home your puppy. 
I feel and I have seen this be done so wrong and it just creates either potential health issues from stress um, and or confidence issues. So please educate your families. Of course, you can send home the Raising the Empowered Puppy book with them and this will talk all about it. Um, or send them the link and they can buy it. You can become an affiliate as well, so you get the kickback. So um, just wanted to throw that out there. But the first three to five days, remind your clients. The pup, they've been planning and preparing and they can comprehend what's happening. The puppy cannot. And while they're ready, developmentally, ready to leave their litter mates and their mom and you, it needs to be done correctly and with respect. So remind them, everything in their life is going to change from the smell of their home, losing their mom, losing their litter mates, losing you, losing um, where they go potty, how they're fed, where they're fed. All of their routine and structure is completely blown up. It just is. They're handed off, they're put in a new car, they're sent on their way, some fly, and they get into this new house and nothing is the same. So taking the time, the effort, the energy, the kindness, the compassion to give these puppies a solid three days for your really confident puppies, five days average for your more sensitive, submissive puppies that need a little reassurance to adjust to their new home, their new life, the new smells, where their new potty place is, their new kennel. Um, everything about their house is new. Uh, and if there's new dogs or new cats, new animals, and most importantly, new people. Because if you don't know their stress signals and you haven't created that bond where this puppy knows, okay, you do feed me, you do meet my needs, you are listening to my stress signals, I feel safe with you, then they can't be taking them out and exposing them to new and different exposures and experiences and people and other dogs without that foundation of this is a safe human. I feel safe. And when I look to them, when I give them a stress signal, when I let them know, help, I feel a little overwhelmed, they're there for me. And until they have that, and let's be honest, we all need that. As children, we needed that, and if we didn't get it, we have childhood trauma, right? If we don't get in our relationship, we don't stay in that relationship. We need that safety. So make sure that is created with a puppy before they're taking out to do anything or have anything else new. Right? Like, And I know exposure and new experiences is really important for the development of pup puppies, but remember, everything about their life has changed. So believe me, that's enough for three or five days to have new people, potentially new animals, new space, new potty area, outdoor, indoor areas, a new car, Nothing smells the same, nothing sounds the same, the vacuum sounds different, the dishwasher sounds different, the toilet sounds different, everything is different. So let them adjust and most importantly, build that foundation of trust and respect that that puppy knows, this is my human, this is who I can trust. And then this beautiful thing happens because so no matter where you do take them for the rest of their life, no matter who they're exposed to or where they go, if they ever feel unsure, they can look to you and all you have to do is simply say you're good or yes, or you're okay, or we've got this, or we need to go. All right, I hear you, I see you, let's go. Calmly, matter-of-factly, safely. And this is what makes all the difference in the world. When those puppies are continue to be exposed and pushed into environments or other people without this foundation, without this safe person. This is where we get puppies that fall apart, that lack confidence, that get diarrhea, um, that you know don't do well in the transition, and sometimes for the rest of their life, separation, anxiety, and fear. So there you go. Thanks for riding shotgun with me today. Let's take care of our puppies those first three to five days and really teach our clients Trust and respect has to be built before you add anything else to their life. What are guardian homes and what are some things you should consider? Because believe me, I've heard so many stories and I've experienced so many things myself. 
Ultimately though, I have a whole entire class broken down of pros and cons, things to think about in our mini series. How do you access that? It's a webinar, so you can watch um, the classes whenever you want. You'll go to badassbreeder.com, click on webinar, and then it's under the mini series. And what I've done is there's like 60 videos of topics broken down. So I spend an hour to two sometimes talking about one thing, um, whether it's Giardia, whether it's Guardian Homes, whether it's mastitis, whether it's tube feeding, so forth and so forth. Um, anyway, but a quick little ditty about Guardian Homes. What are they? Should you consider them? And just a few pros and cons. So I'm not gonna dive real deep. I only got a few minutes. Um, Guardian home is where the parent lives with their forever home essentially. So there's lots of different ways in which you can mitigate and manage this through contract. Um, what's allowed, what's not allowed, what's expected um, in dealing with another family. So technically you legally own the dog, but the dog lives with their forever family now, comes back to you to breed, goes back to them while pregnant and a stud would be different, of course, and then comes back to have their puppies. When they retire, I spay and neuter, and then the family just keeps it, him or her. Um, there's lots of different considerations as far as what that contract looks like to protect you and that they feel comfortable with. I share a lot of that in the mini series, and um, we'll be revamping that for the Badass Breeder Revised Edition number two. <laughs> It's coming eventually. Um, but good things about guardian homes, of course, are the dog already lives with their forever home. But I will say they can be more difficult to manage during their litter because they're not at home. They're not used to living there. So we do bring them back around day 50 just to get them settled in so they're not so anxious or antsy or unsure. I will say the first litter is always the toughest. They don't know what to expect. They're a brand new mom. Everything is different and new, unless you have the guardian come back for visits, which you can do. I mean, there's lots of different ways you can do this. There's no one wrong or right, right way. It depends on your guardian families, which there's a lot to consider with that too. You're dealing with someone else's emotions. Um, I've had guardians want to completely veil and be like, I'll just buy the dog out. We can't do this. I can't live without my dog. Um, so I've had to learn and tweak and change the language a lot in my contract that if you're that type of person, then don't be a guardian. Like it has to be a selfless act. You have to be willing to be part of the bigger picture. You have to be willing to share a part of our dog um, to produce puppies that can change lives, heal hearts and change lives. So if um, I've had people then really think about that, sleep on it, think about it, and that that's not something you're willing to do, then don't be a guardian, buy a puppy. Um, some of my favorite guardians are people that have bought a puppy from me and they've been very active still in our, in our community. I've seen that they've just, the way they've moved and talked and um, the way they've raised their dog, even on social media, and I've always kept a good connection with them. Those are some of my favorite guardians. They already have one of my puppies and they become a guardian. Um, so then they always have a dog at home as well. So when the, the parent comes to breed, then they're not without a dog because that is a consideration. If it's the only dog in the house, what does that look like? But then there's also a lot of other considerations of trusting somebody and or the pack environment when you bring in an unspayed female or a um, unaltered male, which is another whole ball game. Ultimately, at the end of the day, this is what I always have to think though. When I let a dog walk out the door to be in a guardian home, I have to be willing and be realistic that at some point I could lose that dog, whether it's accident, tragedy, break of the contract, um, Lots of different things. I go into depth in this. I don't want to say a lot of it online, honestly, for everybody to see things that have happened. Give anybody any ideas. Um, so you have to be willing. These aren't lines that can't be reproduced. This isn't the core of your program. Lots of things to think about. So Guardian Homes, there's amazing, great things about them, but there's things you have to think about and make sure you're covered for. Tell me some of your stories below. Thanks for riding shotgun today.